um, get fired ahead then. So I, I think we have a pretty good number of people who are now uh, logged in. Adam, I just saw your face there. Hello. All right. So um, everybody, it gives me my, my very great pleasure to introduce to you my friend um, and former slash still colleague, although more remote, remotely, uh, Dr. Andrew McRae. So Andrew is an emergency physician and uh, currently works at Foothills Medical Center and Rocky View General Hospital in Calgary. He did complete his residency training at Queens before he came and joined us at LHSC. And while he was with us, he worked uh, as a staff physician and he was also completing his PhD in epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, and while he was doing that, he brought our research program forward uh, a long way. Now, since, re since running away from us, I mean, since relocating to Calgary in 2010, his research focus has actually been more, more on improving the accuracy on diagnostic and prognostic tools for emergency patients, um, and particularly with suspected coronary artery disease. On a side note, Andrew is an amazing uh, cyclocross cyclist, uh, mountain biker. Okay, fine. Thanks, Grant. Uh, Grant probably thinks he's better than Andrew, but uh, Andrew and, and, uh, and his wife, Michelle, are both uh, fantastic cyclists and competitive cyclists. Um, he's also quite the coffee snob. He always had his uh, very fancy espresso machine set up at his house. Um, and apparently over COVID, he started making sourdough bread like many of the rest of us. So, and uh, ukulele, that's the most recent uh, endeavor. So a man of many talents, but uh, first and foremost for today, He's an emergency physician, um, an academic researcher, and uh, one of the smartest guys I know. So welcome again, Andrew. We're really glad to have you back uh, talking to us here in London. Thanks, Christine, for that uh, very kind introduction. I'll get my screen sharing going here. And would have nice to have been there in, in person to catch up with all of you. Um, I gotta say, I've been, been reflecting a little bit uh, about uh, things that, that I miss about London, and we're starting, we're getting our, our third snowfall of the season now. Um, and, uh, you know, I gotta say, I, I really miss um, skiing that awesome ice at Bowler Mountain, because uh, I gotta say, the, uh, the deep powder that we get here consistently, um, it, it gets a little bit boring after a while. Um, so I, I uh, so that, that's, it's actually not really what I miss most about London. I miss the, the people most. Um, everyone there is a fantastic group of, of docs and nurses and colleagues and it would have been really nice to, to have been able to, to catch up in person, but uh, unfortunately because of, of circumstances, that's just, uh, this is just the, the way it is. Um, so just gonna get a few formalities out of the way before we get into the, the main body of the talk, uh, and that's just uh, financial disclosures. I currently get some research funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to improve the accuracy of cardiac risk prediction in the emergency department, and I'll be sharing some of that funded work today, uh, but that's really the only significant financial disclosure that, uh, that I need to share at, uh, at the start of the talk. Um, I think we can all relate to the experience of caring for a patient with chest pain, and in spite of them having a low-risk ECG, low-risk troponin findings, we wonder whether they might be at risk of a cardiac event in the near future. And so what I want to do today is spark a conversation around how can we improve the care for patients with suspected coronary disease and achieve multiple wins of improving patient outcomes, reducing low-value testing, and cutting down on the sleepless nights that we all have, wondering about patients that we discharge from the emergency department. So our talk today is gonna to go like this. I'm gonna talk first about some conflicting evidence on whether follow-up or non-invasive testing is helpful after we've ruled out an MI for patients in the emergency department. I'm gonna talk next about why more careful estimation of a patient's pretest probability matters in making the best use of non-invasive testing. Then we'll talk a bit about where I think research needs to go to give us the tools that we need to make better use of follow-up testing. And I don't wanna give away the ending, but we might be left with more questions than answers, and I hope that sets up a great discussion afterwards. So let's talk a bit first about the dollars and cents of non-invasive testing. In the US, a lot of non-invasive testing after MI rule out is driven by guidelines and medical legal concerns 
plus the fact that non-invasive testing of low-risk patients is a huge revenue generator for hospitals. It's a little bit different in Canada, but there are definitely some market forces at work. So in Alberta, over the last 20 years, the number of clinics doing non-invasive testing or imaging has quadrupled. It's far outstripping the rate of population growth. And this probably wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been a demand for it. So between guideline recommendations, different patient factors and physician factors, we send a lot of patients for post-discharge consultation or non-invasive testing after a low-risk workup for chest pain in the emergency department. We don't always consider the downside of sending patients for post-discharge testing or follow-up, especially after a thorough ED workup with serial troponins and serial ECGs. The risk of a short-term adverse event is really, really low. So by routinely sending patients for non-invasive testing, we might limit the access to urgent testing for higher risk patients who are more likely to benefit. Some patients are reassured by the idea of having additional testing, but some get quite anxious by waiting, having to wait for a second opinion, even though we know that they're low risk. And finally, it doesn't happen very often, but when you consider the risk of false positives and the need to act on a positive test result, we probably expose more patients than we need to to radiation risks, contrast reactions, or vascular injuries. And finally, there's the actual financial cost. And I wanna share some back and napkin calculations that they probably aren't super precise, but they give us a bit of a, an idea of the magnitude of the cost that we're, we're talking about. So in any one given year, Canadian emergency departments see about 650,000 patients with chest pain or suspected acute coronary syndromes. Fortunately, we're able to send about 85% of those patients home. And looking at Alberta data and Ontario-based data, out of those patients that we send home, we refer maybe a quarter of them either for outpatient consultation or non-invasive testing. So almost 140,000 patients a year. Then when you figure that the cost of an outpatient cardiology visit, uh, as, you know, the fee codes vary from province to province, but we're probably looking at a minimum of 200, uh, 200 bucks per visit. That gets us pretty quickly up to about $28 million a year. And add in the cost of additional testing after that, our cardiologists figure that of the patients that we send them, they test probably a third of them with some sort of non-invasive test. So at least 45,000, probably more non-invasive tests across the country after discharge from the emergency department. And at minimum, um, you know, an exercise stress test, the fee code in Alberta for that's 80 bucks. Other tests cost more. At minimum, we're looking at another 4 million bucks. So we're talking about somewhere in the magnitude of $30 million a year that we spend on uh, post-ED discharge, uh, either consultation or non-invasive follow-up or non-invasive testing or follow-up. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that we should do everything that we can to get the most diagnostic utility for our money. Now, all that being said, we should talk about the evidence whether post-discharge follow-up or non-invasive testing is helpful. And I'm gonna present some evidence that it's good, some evidence that's bad, and see how we can piece things together. So let's start with some evidence suggesting that post-discharge follow-up is a good thing. This is some data that some of my cardiology colleagues presented at the AHA Congress a couple of years ago. Uh, it followed a, a year's worth of patients who were discharged from emergency departments in Alberta after an ED visit for chest pain. So about 30,000 patients. And first, the really good news is that the risk of adverse events in the month after they left the emergency department was really, really low. 0.05% 30-day mortality, 90-day mortality, 0.1%. So really good news is that we're doing a good job of making sure that we're not sending patients home who are, who are likely to have events. What they did with these patients is that they compared their outcomes depending on whether they were referred to a chest pain clinic. So these are, are clinics that are able to do non-invasive testing in-house, or if they went to an internist or freestanding cardiologist's office, or if they were followed up by a family doctor and had no follow-up and, and compared um, their utilization of, of emergency departments and hospitals afterwards. What they found is that in patients who were referred to a chest pain clinic, 
they had half of the risk of uh, a 30 day return to the emergency department visit and a much smaller risk of a 30 day admission as well. So the conclusion here is that patients who get referred um, to chest pain clinics after emergency department discharge use fewer healthcare resources afterwards. So potentially referring patients to, to a cardiology clinic is a good thing. It's a very similar and compelling story in Ontario. And these are two population-based studies of patients who were discharged from 86 Ontario emergency departments in a calendar year. Um, the first looked at just over 200,000 patients who were basically healthy. Uh, so no diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Um, and they had an emergency department visit for chest pain and were subsequently discharged. And they compared outcomes based on whether the patient was sent to a cardiologist in follow-up or whether they followed up with their family doctor and had no, uh, or no cardiology follow-up. Um, and what they found was that the, the hazard risk for one-year death was 0 0.8. So a 20% reduction in the hazard risk uh, for one-year mortality uh, for healthy patients that were uh, referred to a cardiologist. And a similar striking story for patients who already have cardiovascular comorbidities. So 57,000 patients with diabetes and pre-existing cardiac disease who had an ED visit for chest pain and were discharged. And patients who were referred to a cardiologist had a substantially lower one-year risk of death uh, if they were referred to a cardiologist compared to if they followed up with their primary care provider or had no follow-up. So the conclusion here is that cardiologist follow-up after emergency department discharge on a population level saves lives. But there's also some evidence, mostly from the United States, that has been starting to emerge over the last few years that maybe non-invasive testing after a low-risk ED workup doesn't really help as much as we think that it might. Um, this is a, a big study of US insurance claims data published in 2015 looking at 420 some thousand patients who had an emergency department visit and subsequently had an MI ruled out. And again, the six month risk of serious adverse events is extraordinarily small, 0.3%. Of those patients, over two thirds of them got additional non-invasive testing and a third of them didn't. And what they found is that in the patients who got non-invasive testing, there was a much higher use of invasive angiography and getting a stent, but there is no difference in the risk of experiencing an MI. So all of the extra stuff that the patients got um, from non-invasive testing to the group that ended up going, going on to get angiograms and a PCI, they didn't have any lower risk of having a heart attack in, in the follow-up period. Um, so questionable evidence or, or evidence that the value of non-invasive testing, especially in a low risk population, um, is really quite minimal. Similar story in another uh, group of uh, uh, patients who were seen a, in a, an integrated healthcare system in the States, uh, about 80,000 patients who had MI ruled out in the emergency department. They used a, a technique called instrumental variable analysis to create similar comparison groups. So it makes it for a better comparison in a retrospective study. And they compared patients who either did or didn't get non-invasive testing within 72 hours of having their uh, MI ruled out in the ED. What they found was that the number needed to test to prevent any adverse event like death or MI was at least 250. And so that's a lot of non-invasive tests to try to prevent one adverse event. So how can we put all this together? There's seemingly conflicting evidence that follow-up might be helpful and follow-up might not be helpful. So how do we actually make sense of it all? And one plausible explanation for the evidence that we see is that we might be actually sending the wrong patients for follow-up. And that's driving the, the kind of findings in those uh, observational population-based study. So this is another analysis of that Ontario-based data that, uh, that I mentioned before. Um, 60,000 patients with pre-existing diabetes or known coronary disease who were seen in emergency departments and discharged after uh, a visit for chest pain. And of those patients, 17% went to see or were referred to see a cardiologist in follow-up 
uh, in the month after emergency department discharge. And what this analysis did was it looked at the patient factors that predicted whether they were referred to cardiologist follow-up or not. So the factors that were associated with being seen by a cardiologist were if you're a male patient between the ages of 50 and 70, if you had a cardiology consult in the emergency department or in the previous year, or if you were a patient seen in a tertiary care center. That, those things made you more likely to be associated with uh, seeing a cardiologist in follow-up. So traditional cardiac risk factors plus some system factors that made you more likely to be referred to a cardiologist. Some of the factors against cardiology follow-up were being aged 70 or older, if you'd had a prior myocardial infarction, if you'd had a history of heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, dementia, and a whole bunch of other things that actually increased your risk of dying. And so it, what it turns out, uh, that, you know, the, I wonder if the, the conclusion that we might draw from this is that maybe the apparent mortality benefit from seeing a cardiologist is because we're actually paradoxically referring the patients at higher risk of dying back to their family doctors and rather than to cardiologist follow-up. So the, it leads to the question, are we, are we sending the wrong patients to, to, the, uh, to the right providers? So, you know, the US data, I think, tells a bit of a similar story. Um, is there benefit to testing in a low-risk population? The risk of revascularization in the populations that they were seeing was you know, between 0.3 and 3% in 30 days. The risk of MI was less than half of 1% in 30 days. And the risk of death was less than 0.1% in 30 days. So this just drives home the point that the utility of testing isn't so much a feature of the tests themselves, but the utility is driven by the pretest probability in the patients that we refer for, patient, uh, for testing. I want to hammer home this point a little bit by talking about the tests themselves. So let's look at exercise stress testing after a patient has an MI ruled out in the emergency department. So we know the risk of adverse outcomes after an MI is ruled, is ruled out is small. Um, but let's talk about testing for coronary disease. And let's say generously that in patients with no documented history of coronary disease, who have a low risk workup in the emergency department. So reassuring electrocardiograms, reassuring troponin findings. Let's say generously that the risk of having significant coronary disease that needs intervention is about 5%. That estimate's probably a bit high, but I think a, a, an overly high estimate reinforces the point. And we send these patients for exercise stress testing, which has, um, sensitivity for significant coronary disease just shy of 70 percent specificity in the upper 70s you can quibble with me on exact numbers depending on which study you quote but i think that's in the right ballpark anyways if we plug these numbers into a fagan nomogram that gives us a post-test probability of significant coronary disease of no higher than 13 percent if a patient has a positive stress test after that but you're kind of committed to doing more tests even though there's an 87% chance that, that patient with a positive test doesn't have significant coronary disease. So maybe the thing to do is to try a more accurate test, like a stress echo. So again, sensitivity, specificity numbers, sensitivity certainly better than uh, an exercise treadmill, te uh, treadmill ECG test. Specificities, what you see there, again, you can quibble with me on numbers depending on which study you quote, but it's probably in the right ballpark. If you plug this into a Fagan nomogram, you still only get a post-test probability of 18%. And so in a low-risk population, a more accurate test probably doesn't help you all that much. So let's pull out the big guns, coronary CT angiography. Again, Sensitivity and specificity numbers substantially better than treadmill ECG testing. Uh, we assume a, a 5% prevalence of coronary disease in the patient uh, population we're testing. Plug that into a Fagan nomogram, and still the post-test probability in a patient who has a positive test 
if they have a low pretest probability is still no higher than 32%. So two to one odds on a, on a positive test being a false positive. So I'm not criticizing the tests themselves. I just want us to be aware that the utility of, our, of a test and our confidence in our, our results and our ability to act on them appropriately is profoundly influenced by the pretest probability of the condition that we're testing for. With coronary disease especially, the problem is with false positives because even with a really good test like coronary CT, if a patient is low risk and tests positive, it's twice as likely that their result is a false positive instead of a true positive. And that's a big deal because as a physician following up on a test result, it's really hard to ignore a positive coronary CT. It's hard not to act on that further. And you know, the patient with a positive coronary CT is in, a, in a, lot of, a lot of cases gonna be going on to invasive angiography. And so it, it's in our patient's interest to make sure that, that we're making best use of these tests uh, and making sure that we're using the tests in patients who are most likely to benefit from the information that those tests give us. So how can we be more selective about patients that we send for non-invasive testing? And one common approach is to use clinical risk scores to identify low risk patients who may not need additional testing or higher risk patients who should get set testing sooner. One problem that we don't have is a shortage of risk scores to choose from. There's a lot out there. So my recently graduated master's student, Connor O'Reilly, he's now doing first year of medical school by Zoom here at the U of C. Um, he did a systematic review comparing the accuracy as well as the classification performance of several different risk scores in conjunction with high sensitivity troponin testings. Across all scores, the sensitivity for predicting short-term major adverse cardiac events is really good. So if a patient has a low risk score, we can be pretty confident that they're unlikely to have a bad outcome. The score that correctly classified the greatest number of patients as low risk, so the most efficient score, was the heart score using a cutoff of three or less to define low risk. But heart risk scores like the heart score should probably come with a warning label that they were developed with a specific purpose in mind and not necessarily the purpose that we might wanna use them for. And the heart score actually asks and answers a very different question than the question we often use it to help answer. So in our clinical practice, we're interested in predicting adverse cardiac events or undiagnosed coronary disease in patients who've had an MI ruled out after ECG and troponin testing. But when you look at the heart score development and validation studies, they included a very different population. They included all patients with chest pain who didn't go directly to the cath lab. In other words, the heart score was developed in undifferentiated chest pain patients, including those who were ultimately diagnosed with a non-STEMI or a non-cardiac cause of the chest pain. So a completely different population than we would want to use it in, in trying to estimate risk after, uh, after an ED workup. The other problem with the heart score is that the outcomes in the original heart score studies are different than the ones that we're interested in predicting. We want to predict which patients are going to have an adverse cardiac event after the patient's discharge from the ED. But the outcome in the original heart score studies was 42-day major adverse cardiac events, so death, subsequent MI, or revascularization, including the diagnosis of a non-STEMI on the initial emergency department encounter. So to show it graphically, we're interested in predicting outcomes that are gonna happen from day one of follow-up onward. Whereas the original heart score papers were interested in, in identifying outcomes from day zero onward. And most of the outcomes that they observed were actually on that initial emergency department visits. They were non-STEMIs diagnosed in the emergency department. So in reality, the 42-day MACE outcome that they used was really a surrogate outcome for any acute coronary syndrome that presented to the emergency department. So effectively, the heart score and many of the risk scores we're familiar with, I'm just picking on the heart score because we found it to be the, the most accurate one and because it's really commonly used. Um, these risk scores in a lot of cases 
are not actually risk prediction tools, but rather they're diagnostic tools for any acute coronary syndrome on the index visit, and they're not necessarily prognostic tools. What that means is that if we're using a risk score outside of the purpose it was developed for, we may not be able to hang our hats on the published risk estimates for, moderate, uh, for high, moderate, and low risk patients. So I'll just try to illustrate this graphically just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So what, exist, what a lot of existing chest pain risk scores do is they take a, a population of undifferentiated chest pain patients and they're looking to identify patients who have an acute coronary syndrome on their index uh, presentation. But they might use an outcome like 42-day MACE as a surrogate outcome to try to capture incidents of unstable angina on the index visit. And what they do is they try to identify a low-risk population in whom acute coronary syndrome can be ruled out, but they're left with a very large population at risk that we don't really know what to do with and often get, you know, the, the logical thing to do is to commit these undifferentiated patients to, to further testing. What we really need to do a risk prediction score to do is to be more selective. So start with our undifferentiated chest pain population. And we do a lot of things in the emergency department that um, you know, part of our workup actually helps to narrow the population of interest. So take any patient with obvious ischemic ECG changes or any patient with troponin values that are indica indica indicating a non-STEMI plus any other patients that have a clear non-cardiac cause. These patients don't need a risk score because they already have a diagnosis. So what we're left with is a much smaller population at risk. And so out of this smaller population at risk, we should be able to identify a much larger group of patients who are low risk and not at need of additional testing, which is good because the outcomes that we're actually looking for are really, really infrequent in this, uh, in patients who've had, uh, uh, in patients who've had an acute coronary syndrome ruled out in the ED. Maybe the heart score still does a good enough job of predicting adverse events after an MI has been ruled out in the ED. And this is some more work from Connor's thesis that if CAPE had happened this past year, he would have presented it uh, as an abstract, and we're still working on, uh, on writing up the paper. It's a secondary analysis of a data set that we used to, uh, previously to validate high sensitivity troponin algorithms. And he looked at a subgroup of patients in whom MI was ruled out using a two hour high sensitivity troponin T algorithm, uh, looked at their outcomes, and looked at whether we can use the heart score to make better decisions around who to send for non-invasive testing. So this is about 350 patients. And the first bit of good news is that the risk of adverse events in this population who've had an MI ruled out using high sensitivity troponin is extraordinarily small. So it's a really low risk a group of patients to start with, even before you start doing any kind of clinical risk stratification. The second bit of good news is that a heart score of three or less was 100% sensitive for identifying patients who were at risk of 30-day adverse cardiac events after emergency department discharge. But even though the overall risk of death or MI was really low, still 40% of patients had a heart score of four or higher, putting them in, in, in what's traditionally thought of as a moderate risk category. So if we use a heart score with a cutoff of three to guide decisions about who to refer for consultation or who to refer for non-invasive testing, the good news is that we'll be really safe, but it puts us at the risk of overestimating what a patient's risk might be and puts us, puts us at risk of, of possibly over-testing. So again, good news, when we designate a patient as being low risk, we can be really confident in that assessment. And that's great news. But my final objective today is to promote a discussion of how can we get from really good to even better?
one of the things you might have noticed during this talk is that I've referred to a lot of different outcomes of interest that we that we might be trying to predict. I've talked about diagnosis of acute coronary syndromes in the emergency department. I've talked about major adverse cardiac events like death, subsequent MI, or revascularization uh, after discharge from the ED. And I've talked about the diagnosis of new or not previously diagnosed coronary disease. And I've almost used these outcomes somewhat interchangeably. And I've done that because the literature does that. And we do that sometimes when we're trying to apply evidence indirectly to, to create clinical pathways, um, to, to come up with, with clinical pathways to decide, uh, help guide us to about who to, who to send for non-invasive testing. So there's a lot of conflating of outcomes, uh, both in the literature and in our actual practice. Um, but those outcomes, aren't all the same. They have different consequences for patients and for the healthcare system, never mind the fact that they're numerically different. So to make the best use of non-invasive testing resources, I think we need to step back and have a broader discussion as a specialty about what we're trying to achieve by sending patients for non-invasive testing after a low-risk ED workup. So just what is it that we're trying to identify when we refer patients for follow-up uh, consultation or for non-invasive testing? Are we trying to identify patients who are at risk of serious cardiac events like death or subsequent MI? Or are we trying to identify cases of coronary disease that may not have a short-term event, but may eventually have a longer-term event that, might, that risk might be modifiable with appropriate therapy? Those are two really different outcomes, and they're both potentially really important, but I think we need to have a conversation as a specialty about what, uh, you know, what, uh, what it is that we're, what we're, we're trying to achieve by, by sending patients for non-invasive testing. And the conditions that we're trying to identify with testing are also different depending on whether a patient already has existing coronary disease or not. So, we're not talking about necessarily a homogeneous population of patients who've had MI ruled out. We're talking about patients who either do or don't already have pre-existing coronary disease. And we're asking different questions in these different populations. In patients who don't have known coronary disease, we obviously care about trying to predict the risk of adverse events, but we probably also care of identif about identifying patients who have previously unknown high-grade coronary stenosis. For patients who do have pre-existing or known coronary disease, we're interested in predicting adverse events too, but we're also interested in a different question. Do these patients have progression of their coronary disease that requires a change in treatment to reduce their long-term risk? And I wonder if it might be too much to hope for for a single clinical risk score to predict all of these outcomes in a very heterogeneous group of patients. Another question that we need better evidence on is when should eligible patients undergo non-invasive testing? AHA guidelines recommend testing within 72 hours. Canadian Cardiovascular Society doesn't have specific recommendations, but 72 hours is probably the exception and not the rule in a lot of places in Canada. So when should we be referring patients for, for non-invasive testing? This is some more work from Connor's thesis, looking at the time to events for patients who have MI ruled out in the emergency department. And the blue line on the survival curve is men's, the red line is women. We can, most of these events are revascularizations. And what we see is in the first two weeks after emergency department discharge, there's, there's kind of a slow burn of events that slowly accumulate, getting up to about a, a, a three or 4% uh, overall uh, event rate. And like I said, the vast majority of, of these events uh, are revascularizations and not deaths or, or subsequent MIs. Um, and so it begs a couple of questions. Uh, it begs, you know, so when should we be doing uh, non-invasive testing to identify patients who might need to have uh, revascularization? And is there a way that we might be able to better prioritize urgent, uh, urgent testing? Can we do a better job of risk stratifying and identifying the truly high risk patients who should be prioritized for urgent testing and then confidently delaying mod more moderate or low risk cases uh, to a later, uh, a later time of testing? 
We also need to consider if we're only interested in short-term events or should we be equally interested in longer-term events? Some people in the emergency com uh, medicine community have some pretty strongly held beliefs that in the ED, we should only be concerned with short-term events because really that's all that's within our control as emergency care providers. But patients obviously care about both short-term and long-term care events. And some would argue that the emergency department doesn't exist in isolation from the rest of the healthcare system. And we may be able to contribute to better outcomes by helping to mitigate longer-term risk if we, are, if we do start to take an interest in trying to better predict long-term events. So these are the questions that I think as a researcher are worth discussing as we look to try to take our practice from really good to even better. What are the outcomes that doctors and patients care about most? And do we need different tools to predict those different outcomes? Can we develop better evidence to guide not only who needs additional testing, but when? And thinking to the future, are there other approaches that we should be looking at now that might not be ready for prime time, but that will be ready for prime time in the not so distant future. So I'll leave you with some closing thoughts. First, the good news is that when we identify a patient as low risk, we can be really confident that we can probably forgo non-urgent non-invasive testing because their risk of a significant adverse event in the 30 days to six weeks after an emergency department encounter is extraordinarily small. But the tools we use to clinically risk stratify patients certainly err on the side of sensitivity. And there is a chance that we might be overestimating our patients' risk of short-term events and possibly over-testing. So there's work to do to take our practice from really good to even better. And in trying to provide more personalized care to our patients, Better isn't necessarily simpler, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a one-size-fits-all solution for clinical risk stratification uh, of patients being discharged from the emergency department after a chest pain encounter. And so with that, uh, I want to say thank you very much for having me again, and I would love to hear what you all think. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm looking to see if there's anything in the chat, but um, please do uh, put some questions in the chat or, or uh, if you're able to put a hands up or a wave. Uh, I'd love to hear what uh, hear what you guys think because sometimes in a, as a as a researcher and even as, as someone practicing in a, in a different center, we get into a bit of a an echo chamber about the you know the the ideas that we think are important, or we start agreeing with all of our colleagues. And I think it's important to 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 hear voices and perspectives from uh, from other places and other people. So I'd love to hear what you guys think about what our priorities should be in terms of referring patients for non-invasive testing after a chest pain workout. Hi, I'm Mason. I'm one of the residents here. I thought it was a really interesting talk, and I like the way that you broke it down um, with short-term adverse events versus long-term long -term modifiable uh, disease. And a lot, a lot throughout the talk, you seem to talk about the risk of short-term events. That being said, people who are low risk with heart negative, high sensitivity troponin, do you have any numbers as to how many of those actually end up having coronary disease that is potentially modifiable in the long term? Because I assume it's much higher than that 0.3% that have uh, short-term adverse events. And, and if so, then perhaps we should be referring even more people to these non-invasive tests, but with the understanding that it's more for medical management and optimization of long-term outcomes rather than avoiding short-term adverse events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm not aware of good evidence looking specifically at the outcome of new diagnoses of coronary disease. I mean, that's, that's certainly in, in the projects that we're actively working on, that's going to be, that, that is one of the outcomes that we're, we're interested in predicting. Um, but you're right, the vast majority of literature is focused on, on short-term uh, short adverse events. Um, as far as the diagnosis of coronary disease, I agree with you. I think it's important. Um, I think it gets to the question, not just who should we be sending for testing, but also when. Because even if, you know, among patients who do have undiagnosed coronary disease, 
the risk of a short-term event is extraordinarily small. And so I'm not sure that we're going to get always going to get a whole lot of value by sending patients for testing within 72 hours. Um, and so I think it's probably worth um, following, you know, existing uh, primary prevention screening guidelines. You know, the fact that somebody's come in with symptoms might be a red flag that we should probably be testing them, them sooner than, than a family doctor might just by meeting uh, primary care screening guidelines. Um, but I don't necessarily think that, need, that they need to be tested within 72 hours. So I, think, I just think we need better evidence, um, specifically looking at the outcome of coronary disease to help us figure out who should we be testing and when, um, but probably reserving the urgent testing for patients who are at high risk of having bad outcomes in the short term. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Is it possible that high-risk patients are being sent to a GP and not referred to cardiology because they're already followed by a cardiologist and you're hoping the GP or patient arranges an appointment with the cardiologist sooner? Um, I think that might be possible. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's certainly one, uh, one possibility. Um, but to me, that kind of begs the question, why aren't we referring these patients directly back to their primary cardiologist? rather than leaving it to their family doctor because you know it just cut you know it's it seems like a, a necessary an unnecessary middle step if we have a patient who we know have advanced coronary disease um getting their cardiologist input is probably incredibly valuable in terms of should these patients have any additional testing to see if their coronary disease has progressed significantly or do they need to have uh, any kind of modification of, the, of their current therapeutic regimen. And so I'm, I'm not sure that there's, you know, any practical value in, uh, in, in inserting that additional step of, of follow of getting them to see their family doctor first before us referring them back to, to our cardiologist. So, um, you know, how things work here in Calgary, that we have a number of, of chest pain clinics that, uh, that see patients in follow up. And if we send, we refer them a patient who already has a, a connection to a cardiologist, they just redirect the referral to that cardiologist. And so what I think really needs to happen is, is making sure that there's good accessibility uh, to a patient's existing cardiologist and trying to get them back to see that cardiologist as, as, uh, as soon as feasibly possible to get, to get their insight and opinion on, on, on next steps. Because patients with existing cardiac disease are, are tough. And I think having a you know, trying to get that opinion before proceeding to any uh, additional testing is, is probably useful. Yeah, so Julie putting a hand up. Hi, thanks so much for um, a really great talk. I'm one of the staff at LHSC. Um, and I was curious as to how, um, in Calgary, you use the heart score to help you um, direct your referrals. At our center, our cardiology team um, has put together a referral form that uses the heart score to try and stratify out per, outpatient versus inpatient cardiology referrals. And I don't know if it's an error, but I notice on the form they've um, the age criteria isn't included. So just knowing that the heart score does include age, I find myself struggling with over consultation versus under consultation because the form itself says if a patient has a score. Um, underneath such and such number, it should be fine for outpatient uh, consultation. But if it's higher than, I believe it's three, but um, um, on the form it says, if it's higher than such and such number, an inpatient referral is recommended. So I find myself looking at patients who are sitting on maybe a three, but are very stable and would you know, I would think that they might be lower pretest probability, but I'm stuck making a phone call because this form says that I should probably make an inpatient consult. So I was just wondering how your center um, uses the score and, and uses it to, to triage or direct consults. Yeah, um, we, we don't use it in a, a consistent or formalized way. Um, and so um, 
a lot of us and especially patients or especially docs who are, are in maybe the first 10 years or so of practice and certainly a lot of our residents um, use it as a tool to try to, to risk stratify patients after we've ruled out MI to try to help us decide, are we going to send this patient uh, to, uh, uh, to outpatient consultation? Um, the, we don't have a formal rule saying if they have a score greater than seven, for example, that they should be uh, seen as, as a, an inpatient um, that still often comes down to, to clinical story. Um, and so if it's a high risk story, we will, we'll get a, a consultation in the emergency department. Um, but, but some people use it for, uh, for making decisions uh, about follow up. Um, but again, with the, with the same limitations that, that I talked about is that when you apply it to a population that's already low risk after having normal ECG and troponin results, um, there's probably a good chance that, that, that the heart score might be overestimating your risk, especially in, in younger, healthier patients that, uh, or kind of middle-aged patients who may only have one, one uh, cardiovascular risk factor. Um, so, um, so we don't use it in any formal way. Um, the clinics that accept our referrals uh, on the outpatient side, they use a different risk stratification tool. They use a variation on the Diamond and Forrester score that has a lot of the same elements. It, it has its age, sex, and clinical pretest probability in terms of does were their symptoms uh, typical, atypical, or not at all typical. Um, which you know is is all, you know, two of the heart score elements plus sex. Um, and so that's the, the tool that, that they use. Um, it's been validated in patients in predicting coronary disease in patients who were being referred for angiography, um, but hasn't validated terribly well in the emergency department population. Um, so it's all over the map here. Um, and you know, the, the reality is that we, we probably still don't have the best evidence to, to guide us in, into, into making the, the decisions. But using the heart score the way that, that you're describing and the way that a lot of us use it here in the emergency department in Calgary will be safe, but there might be some patients that we that get referred unnecessarily. Yeah, I'm looking to see if there's any other waving hands out there. My name's David. I'm one of the med students here at London. Yeah. Uh, just wondering if you have any data on the, if we do not refer these low risk patients to cardiology after an initial cardiac workup, and uh, any data on bounce back to the ER for recurrent chest pain, uh, kind of use of healthcare dollars in that way rather than sending them for outpatient cardiac follow up. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess we can go back to the slide that I, I showed earlier um, in Alberta data. Let me just see if I can pull it up here. Hang on a second. Um, uh, where'd it go? Uh, I'll see if I can share my screen here again. So looking at um, patients who were discharged from the ED. I think this was from, I forget if this was from 2011 or 2014, um, looking at, at bounce backs and, and admissions. Um, in, in patients who were discharged from the emergency department, not necessarily stratified using any risk prediction tools, but, but all patients who were discharged, um, it looks like there's somewhere in the neighborhood of about a 1% return to ED within 30 days and the admission rate might be a little bit higher whether they were admitted through the emergency department um, or whether they were seen in a cardiology clinic and brought back to the hospital for for non-invasive testing that would get flagged as an admission it doesn't necessarily mean that they had uh, an, an acute coronary syndrome but whenever somebody comes back for a cath they get a, an admission log in the system so um, so it's you know it's somewhere around one percent in 30 days um, but doesn't necessarily mean that 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 those patients have uh, have had acute coronary syndromes. So, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect.
Uh, all right. Hi, Andrew, it's Roy here. Good to see you again. Oh, you too, Roy. I was wondering if there's any um, uh, evidence of inter-observer reliability of the things like the heart score. It looks to me like up to four of the, the points depend on somebody's uh, interpretation of the history as being suspicious or not, and uh, ECG interpretation skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, often, if somebody does come back with an adverse event, uh, the, uh, the score in the ECG can be um, uh, interpreted a little differently than the initial. So mm -hmm. just wondering about that. Yeah, um, it certainly has. I don't have the the reliability numbers at kind of the right at my uh, at the tip of my tongue right now. I can I can find them for you and send them. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure it has been studied. It's just not not right at the at the forefront of my cortex right now. Um, and ECG, you're you're absolutely right that there certainly is some variability. Um, I think that, you know, the, the take home message there is just get really good at reading ECGs. Um, so, um, Chris Byrne in the comment box. Um, so expand on the idea that heart score is better conceptualized as a, as a diagnostic tool. Um, and, um, lack of a diagnostic reference or gold standard. Um, so, um, yeah, Chris, are you, are you there in person? Do you, you think you might be able to, to, to chime in by, by voice? Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, Andrew, if that's a bit of a long-winded question. It's just a topic I have, have a personal uh, interest in because I, I, I did some work on the heart score as well. Um, I, I, I may have misunderstood, but I think at one point during your, your presentation, you mentioned that the heart score is better than Yeah, sorry, Chris, we're losing your audio there. Yeah, so so Chris, we lost your audio there a bit, um, but I think so. So the question is, you know, why have I described the heart score as a diagnostic tool for for acute coronary syndrome? Um, and when you look at the the original heart score studies from uh, from the Netherlands um, and a lot of the other uh, existing um, emergency department risk scores as well. They explicitly say we're looking, we developed the score to identify acute coronary syndromes in the emergency department. And so um, what they're effectively trying to do is a, a diagnostic tool to diagnose acute coronary syndromes, referring to STEMI, non-STEMI, unstable angina. Um, but because it's hard to get a, a reliable or valid diagnosis of unstable angina to use as a research outcome, um, they used a 42-day 40 outcome of any MI death or revascularization as almost a surrogate outcome or a surrogate marker of an acute coronary syndrome on their, their index visit. Um, so instead of, of explicitly saying we're trying to diagnose unstable angina because that's a hard diagnosis to make clinically, um, they use the outcome, including revascularizations within 42 days, assuming that if somebody comes in with chest pain and then gets a PCI within the, the next six weeks, that emergency department encounter was probably an acute coronary syndrome of some sort. Um, so to my mind, the use of 42-day of MACE uh, even though we often think of it as a prognostic event because it's it's a six week long outcome, um, but what they were doing was they were using that as a surrogate marker of possible unstable angina in the emergency department, given that it's a challenging diagnosis to make on the day of sometimes. Um, so that's where that's where my thought was. Uh, um, that's where my my thought was that that uh, it's it's what they're effectively trying to do is diagnose. Uh, or a tool that will diagnose all acute coronary syndromes in the emergency department. And so if you score zero, 
um, then the probability of you having an acute coronary syndrome of any kind um, is is zero. Um, so um, so it's, they're effectively using it and suggesting that it was originally developed uh, as a diagnostic tool rather than a prognostic one, even though because it looks at 42 out day outcomes, we tend to think of it as a prognostic tool, not realizing that most of the outcomes that they were interested in are, were actually even were actually experienced on their index ED visit. If you actually look at the distribution of outcomes in the original heart score papers, a lot of the outcomes that they're classifying as outcomes were non-STEMIs on their index emergency department visit. So it's it's to my mind it's a it's it's a diagnostic tool that we've co-opted a bit to use as a prognostic tool. Um, so uh, yeah, comment from from Dan uh, on high number of elderly people with atypical or non-cardiac chest pain with risk factors because they're old and older people tend to have risk factors uh, and scoring four because they had a, uh, uh, a troponin greater than 14. Um, yeah, I mean, the patients with, with chronic troponin elevations are tough. Um, and I think that's the challenge of, of using a, a binary troponin cutoff to decide whether it's normal or, or not normal. Um, so, um, you know, and you know, it just, I think it, it just speaks to the fact that that the heart score has limitations, especially when you're when you're dealing with with some of these uh, you know some of these tougher cases. We can all think of of uh, of cases that um, you know they uh, you know a very very young patient with a very high risk story um, who uh, would score low on the heart score. But ends up having a significant coronary lesion, and so it's it's not perfect. And one of the reasons that it's not perfect is that we is um, you know we don't use it for the purpose that it's that it's intended to be developed or it was that it was developed for. And so um, so I, you know I think it 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 has limitations, and I think that's why we're continuing to do research to see if we can do it better. As a general rule, we're it's safe, um, but as as that anecdotal experience suggests. There's a pretty good chance that we're that we're over referring people uh, if we're adhering to it uh, religiously. I think we might have time for maybe one more quick question. If you don't mind, if I can ask a, a follow-up question, it's Mason again. Um, so, if the heart score is good at predicting uh, ACS within the next 40 days. Has there been any consideration to um, that essentially, uh, aside from those people, or, or even with people who are not currently having ACS, we should perhaps just go based on primary care guidelines? Because from my understanding, in non-ACS, optimal medical management is often superior or at least equivalent to invasive strategies. So what are we really looking to stratify, I guess, and what kind of interventions we'll be looking towards leaning to in a non-ACS setting? Mm, yeah, so I guess, you know, the, you know, the question is what proportion of patients have, you know, what proportion of patients have coronary disease versus what proportion of patients have coronary disease and a critical lesion that needs urgent revascularization. And, and the, the former number is probably substantially larger. Um, and what we'd be doing by identifying mild to moderate coronary disease in most patients is just confirming that, yeah, you should probably be on aspirin and statin. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, that's a really valuable kind of, kind of fundamental thoughtful question, um, that we need to, need to consider as researchers is just, what are we, you know, what are we trying to achieve, um, by, uh, by referring patients for, for non-invasive testing? Um, and so we need to be really, really careful and thoughtful about the actual outcomes that we're, that we're looking for. Yeah, the reason why I asked that is because I've worked with a cardiologist who does not do stenting. And his approach was that he prefers um, stress testing to angiography because angiography will often lead you down a path of putting a stent in, which actually doesn't have any mortality benefit, has adverse events, and you're probably better off just to stress test. If it's positive, just call it um, cardiac disease, treat them medically, and then follow up in a couple months to see if they're still having angial symptoms. If not, proceed no further.
Yeah, I mean, that's one way of mitigating the, the risks of false positives. But if you take a low risk patient population and put them on a treadmill, if they have a positive test, there's an 87% chance that's a false positive. So you're still putting patients on an aspirin or statin who don't need it. Um, and so, so the real question is, you know, at, at backing up even further, should we be sending these patients for testing at all? And do we, you know, so regardless of which test you use, and that was kind of my point, is that the test itself doesn't matter if we're sending the wrong patients. Um, it, it, you know, so let's, let's be really, really thoughtful about who we're te sending for testing. Um, and then we can think about the tests themselves once we get the patient population right. Yeah, fantastic questions. Yeah. Andrew, uh, Derek Pringle. Hey, Derek. I like your new hairdo. Thanks. Uh, I, I don't think I'd recognize you. I'm glad I think you're advocating what, what I've often found that, that uh, you know what, we were really good uh, at diagnosing ACS and MI with just a history of physical and ECG. And then we got better with troponin. And then I think that uh, a whole bunch of scores and tests that don't perform very well uh, uh, is just really a waste of time. And I worry about downstream complications of doing needless uh, CT coronary angiograms and, uh, and, and angiograms, period, you know, getting dissections, head and strokes, the radiation you get that's involved in all of that. Um, and, and I think that, uh, that uh, you know, I don't use these scores at all. And uh, it's history, physical, troponin. And I think the rest is, is we're really good at it. And I think you're right. There's a really, there might be a cost to trying to get better than really, really good. Yeah. So, you know, thanks. I mean, I, so I think that, I think we, we kind of agree. It's, I, and it's not so much that the scores are bad and they don't perform well. I don't, I don't think I, I necessarily agree with that characterization, but what I'd say is that, is that they ask the wrong questions in the wrong population. And so, um, so I think, you know, I agree with you for the most part. And what I tend to use is, is, history, physical ECG, and, and you know, is, is there a, you know, is, is there a, a spider sense that this could be, a, um, could be a, an acute coronary syndrome? Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the trick from, you know, the question of can we make this better, is it worth the complexity? Um, well, if we are over-referring patients and subjecting them to potential harms from false positives, we probably still need to get better. And so, so I think there still is, is work to be done. Um, but in the meantime, um, what I, what I want to, you know, kind of the message is, is that um, if you are using a risk score, it's probably best to use it for the exact purpose that it was developed for. Otherwise, it may not be giving you the numbers and risk estimates that you think it is. Um, and so, uh, so I, I think we're generally on the same page there. Yeah. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks. Okay. So, um, Andrew, thank you so much for that uh, very informative talk um, about how we should be maybe further directing our chest pain patients. Um, I would like to invite those that are able, um, and of course all the residents, to stay on for the next two hours. Um, <clears throat> Andrew is going to continue to share his expertise with us, and uh, this time he's really going to talk to us, I guess, a little bit about knowledge translation or when to not incorporate new evidence into your practice. Um, so, Andrew, do you think a five-minute break, or do you want to just uh, fire right ahead? Uh, um, how do you guys usually do things? I'm good to go, but if people think they need five minutes to grab another coffee, um, that's absolutely fine with me. Sounds like people are good to go. Good. All right. Okay, I just have to switch devices because the battery on this one's just about done, but uh, I look forward to listening to the rest. All right, that reminds me, I need to plug my laptop in, so give me. Okay. Okay, well, if everybody's ready to go, um, I think why don't we uh, why don't we get rolling? Um, so thanks again for the invitation to talk with all of you today. Um, I chose what I thought might be a, a deliberately provocative title, um, but this talk isn't about 
blanket decisions when to change your practice based on a new study because practicing evidence-based medicine isn't about making wholesale changes in practice. Uh, I wanna focus instead on when you should or should not apply new evidence to an individual patient in front of you. So let's start by reflecting on the definition of evidence-based medicine. EBM is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And I think that last highlighted bit often gets glossed over as we focus on whether we should make wholesale changes to our practice based on, on new evidence. We talk about practice changing studies. So I'm gonna to talk today mostly about considering implement, whether implementing new evidence is the right call on a patient by patient basis. Uh, before we get going, I want to acknowledge a couple of inspirations for doing this talk. Um, if you read Justin Morgenstern's first 10 EM blog, uh, blog um, there was a post that he put out a couple months ago called EBM 2.0, and that was his reflections on another guy's talk uh, about how we can better apply EBM principles in our practice. Um, there's also a neonatologist out of Burlington, Vermont, named Roger Soule, who's the, the director of the neonatology Cochrane Collaboration. Um, he gave a, a great pediatric grand rounds here at U of C a month or so ago that was also kind of the inspiration for, for this talk. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use some of the same concepts, but not necessarily the, the same examples. But I did want to acknowledge the, uh, um, that, uh, the, the influence that, uh, that those two uh, had on this talk. And, and so this isn't stuff that's coming you know, just, from, just from me, but this is, uh, um, you know, there, there were uh, some things that I've, I've, I've seen recently that have kind of got me thinking and make, got me wanting to talk about this. So um, we're going we're gonna to do a few things. We're going to consider the application of new evidence in light of patient-specific factors. And I want to talk about some red flags in appraising new evidence and using some case studies and some examples to illustrate take-home points. And as, as much as possible, uh, I'm going to try to, to be interactive. So I may ask some, some yes or no questions, some binary questions like that. And if people are able to give a, a thumbs up or a clap sign or something like that, um, I'm, I'm going to see if it's possible for me to, to monitor the chat. Um, just working on some technology here to see, see if I can. Um, but uh, um, so I may have a bit of disconjugate gaze from, from time to time. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll see if I can monitor the chat. Um, so let's see here. There we go. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I'll, uh, we'll get rolling here. Um, so when trying to decide whether to apply new evidence to your patient, I think it's, it's helpful to think a little bit first about how clinical trials present their results. So this is how a clinical trial works. Patients are randomly assigned to a control arm and or to an experimental treatment arm. And some patients do well in the control arm, other people don't do well. In the experimental arm, you have people who are gonna do well, you have people who aren't gonna do well. And then in both arms, you're gonna have people who are gonna do fine no matter what. There's also gonna be people who are gonna have bad outcomes no matter what. And the, the overall result of a trial is basically just, is the ratio of patients who do better in the experimental treatment better than the ratio of, of patients who do better in the, in, in the control. And so what the way that the trial presents its overall results, it doesn't tell, what it doesn't tell us are which are the ones whose outcome changed with a different treatment? So is it these two red people who had bad outcomes before that all of a sudden have good outcomes now? Or is it these two people that now all of a sudden have good outcomes? Or maybe four of these people who had bad outcomes now have good outcomes, but a couple of these people who had good outcomes with the control treatment had bad outcomes there. So. When, a, when we look at a, a clinical trial results, it's really, really hard to say. The challenge in applying this evidence in our practice is figuring out which one of these stick figures is the patient in front of us. So let's use a, a, some case vignettes and some, some study examples to try to figure out 
how to best apply new evidence to our patient. So first case, 34 year old male patient, was a construction worker. Uh, he got a scratch on his shin a few days ago at work and comes in with a small abscess on his right anterior tibia. Um, there's nothing high risk or worrisome about this particular abscess. He's systemically well, there's no cellulitis. He doesn't have any risk factors for MRSA. Um, so just, let's just see in, uh, with, if you're able to, to give any kind of uh, indication there um, with the, the gestures in Zoom. Is there anyone who'd empirically start this patient on uh, an antibiotic like Septra or Clindamycin? No, I'm not seeing many out there. So this is probably the, the first, one of the first landmark studies uh, that looked at the use of adjuvant antibiotics after IND for, uh, for uncomplicated skin abscesses. Uh, it was a multi-center study done in five large emergency departments in the States and enrolled uh, 1,265 patients. And what they found is by adding SEPTRA, uh, to as an adjuvant antibiotic in patients who underwent IND for ab skin abscesses uh, were more likely to have clinical cure. So the, the number needed to treat to improve the clinical cure rate at, I forget whether it was 10 or 14 days, was 14. It's not a bad number needed to treat. And the incidence of adverse events between the two groups, between SEPTRA and placebo, was pretty similar. And so there have been a couple of systematic reviews and meta-analyses since then. A lot of them were, were driven, the results of them were, were driven by this particular study and one other that concluded that adding SEPTRA or some sort of antibiotic may be helpful in the treatment of uncomplicated, uh, uh, uncomplicated abscesses. So how do we apply this particular piece of evidence to our patients? How do we decide whether to treat that 34-year-old construction worker with SEPTRA? So we can look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So does this patient kind of match to the study population? Probably equally important to looking at inclusion and exclusion criteria is looking at the table one clinical characteristics of the patient. So even after all the inclusion and exclusion criteria are filtered through, do my, does my patient still generally resemble the study population? The other important thing to look at are the absolute risks. So in this particular study, the cure rate with placebo was 75%. And the improvement with SEPTRA was that your cure rate went from 74% to 81%. So probably the take home message here that may not be necessarily emphasized is that 75% of patients um, we're gonna do just fine without antibiotics. The other question has to do with MRSA prevalence. The MRSA prevalence in this particular study was 45%. So does anyone know the MRSA prevalence in London? Just unmute yourself and, and shout it out if you, if you can. So there was a, a national study done uh, five or six years ago looking at MRSA prevalence um, among swab isolates after IND. Uh, in Ontario, the number kind of hovered around 25%. I'm not sure if things are substantially different in, uh, in London these days. Um, but it's a, a much lower risk of MRSA. Um, and treating somebody with SEPTRA if they don't have MRSA is probably not going to be terribly helpful. And so um, so this may be an example of when you may not necessarily want to change your practice wholesale, but maybe think carefully about the patient in front of you and whether they're likely to, to benefit from, from antibiotic therapy. So the next case is, is a variation on a, a patient that I saw a year or so ago. Um, and we'll let 47 year old uh, patient, she's healthy. Um, she had onset of palpitations around 7.30, no other high risk or worrisome symptoms. And she was seen in a community department, um, said two hours from London, it was actually three hours from Calgary, um, diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. So she was given 300 milligram, 360 milligrams of PO-deltaizem, given a dose of rivaroxaban, and told 
Um, well, get in your car and have your husband drive you back to London to get cardioverted. And so it comes into your emergency department early in the evening and undergoes a, an uncomplicated cardioversion at 8 p.m. And so the question is, should this person get a 30-day DOAC prescription? So 2018, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society uh, issued some updated recommendations for the management of atrial fibrillation. And one of the changes or one of the recommendations that they made is that in patients going, undergoing unscheduled cardioversion, so basically anyone getting cardioverted in the ED, um, should be started on 30 days of oral anticoagulation uh, after cardioversion in the emergency department and even consider giving them their first dose before you administer the shock. Um, this recommendation, they described it as a, as a, a weak recommendation based on low quality evidence, um, but we all know that, that even weak recommendations um, from, uh, from respected bodies tend to get taken seriously and, in, and, uh, and implemented. Um, this recommendation is based largely on observational studies looking at the 30-day stroke risk um, after unscheduled cardioversion. And what they found was in these observational studies is that patients who were on anticoagulation obviously had a lower 30-day stroke risk after an unscheduled cardioversion. And for patients who weren't on an oral anticoagulation, um, their monthly and annual stroke risk um, was higher than was accept what we generally consider acceptable. Um, and so the recommendation was based on these, uh, these studies um, that patients undergoing unscheduled cardioversion should be started on 30 days uh, of oral anticoagulation. They also identified some risk factors that make it more likely that a patient would have a stroke after cardioversion in the ED. So if they've had atrial fibrillation greater than 12 hours, female patients, patients with other cardiovascular comorbidities, and patients over the age of 75. But also looking at the other subgroup analyses, that in patients with CHADS VAS scores of zero to one in the, the major study that, that drove these recommendations, that the, the stroke risk for these patients was negligible. Um, but in spite of that, they recommended 30 days oral anticoagulation for all patients. And what they said is that, although this is quoting directly from the guidelines, although it may be possible to parse the risks, either on the basis of characteristics or duration of the acute AFib, um, the guidelines committee has chosen to simplify by recommending anticoagulation for one month for all such patients in the absence of a strong indication. So question for this particular patient in front of you is, should we start this patient on 30 days of a DOAC? So any kind of hands there or claps? Is there anyone? What's the, what's the practice been in, in London? Have these recommendations changed things substantially in terms of, of starting patients on 30 days of OAC after cardioversion? I don't know if uh, high Andrew's gory. I don't know if people are actually doing it, but I haven't been. Um, I think that based on the previous CAPE discussions and the panel pet plenary and stuff, uh, it wasn't quite supportive for Emerge Docs. So yeah. that's my personal practice. Yeah. So one thing that I want you to consider in, in trying to apply new evidence or guideline recommendations to your patient is what's the likelihood that giving them this therapy will actually be helpful? It's a patient with a CHAD 65 score of zero, but it's a female patient. They've been in AFib for a little over 12 hours. Um, I don't think you'd be wrong in withholding uh, anticoagulation. You probably also wouldn't be wrong in having a, a more kind of patient-centered discussion and trying to undertake some shared decision-making to, to see if, if, this is, if anticoagulation is, is something that they might be, might be interested in. Um, but I, I don't think you'd be, you know, the, the risk of a, you know, when you consider what's the likelihood that anticoagulation is going to change their outcome, in someone with a CHAD score, is, CHAD 65 score is zero, it's pretty darn small. And, and so, um, again, you know, this kind of highlights the importance of taking into account individual patient factors before kind of blanket, uh, blanket application of, of either new evidence or, or guideline recommendations. So, 
when you're thinking about applying evidence to your patients, it's, it's not just about um, whether this patient fits with the study inclusion criteria. Uh, encourage people to take a more nuanced look at the actual study population that's in table one to say, how does, you know, does this actually map on to the, to the patient, uh, um, uh, to the patient uh, population that I'm seeing? And what's the likelihood that treatment is actually going to make a difference uh, for your particular patient? Sometimes subgroup analyses can give us a, a good hint as to as to whether uh, it's going to be helpful. But um, but uh, you know we'll talk a little bit about some of the potential hazards of uh, of subgroup analysis. I want to talk a little bit about some other red flags about when we should be skeptical of evidence uh, and not necessarily change your practice based on, on, uh, on new evidence. Um, use this as a study point or as a starting point. Uh, paper published in 2005 by a guy named John Ioannidis. Uh, he's a scientist in the States. He published a, a, re a really influential paper called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Um, he did some fascinating statistical modeling, taking into account things like sample size, effect size, risk of bias. And his mathematical models concluded that most published research findings maybe aren't false, but maybe the results don't necessarily accurately represent the truth. And there's a number of things that predict a stud that a study's findings might not be accurate. And I'm gonna focus on a few. I'm gonna fo focus on small studies, small effect sizes, and hot topics. So small studies or studies with a small effect size, the thing that you need to be aware of is that they're more vulnerable to bias. And bias doesn't mean any kind of nefarious or malicious intent. It's just the term for all the reasons that a study's findings might deviate from the truth. And if the sample size is small, or if the observed effect size, size is small, it's far more likely that a study's findings are either influenced by bias or random chance. And like I said, bias can be, bias can come from any number of sources. It can be methodological flaws or, or uh, errors, but it can also come from just simple things like data collection or data entry errors uh, and random chance. And if a study's small or if it shows a really small effect size, um, there's a pretty good chance that, that fi those findings are influenced by either bias or random chance. Small studies are just less robust. They're more vulnerable to, to chance or bias. And related to that concept is, is the concept of, of fragility. Uh, in other words, how many participants with different outcomes would have changed a study's conclusion? Um, there's actually a statistic that's been developed recently and promoted called the fragility index, which is basically the absolute number of patients who would have needed to have a different outcome to change a study's results. Um, it's not a, a perfect statistics, and there's problems with the fragility index as a metric that I won't go into, but it's worth thinking about how many patients with different outcomes, either by chance or some other accounted, unaccounted for reason, would change a study result. And so this is a uh, uh, systematic review uh, of multi-center randomized critical care trials. Uh, so multi-center RCTs in critical care, uh, and it reviewed 56 of them. And what they found in these 56 studies, the mean frig median fragility index, so the average number of patients that would have taken to change a study's findings in this particular critical care systematic review was two. Um, and so uh, I think that gives us reason to, to um, just be, be extra cautious, especially when we're dealing with, uh, with small studies or studies that, that might show a, a small effect. Uh, they're not inherently bad, um, but just be aware of some of the reasons why a, a study's findings might need to be taken with a grain of salt. Hot topics or, or hot clinical topics are another area where we should probably exercise a bit more caution before changing our, our practice based on, on emerging evidence. Um, so when a clinical topic is hot, um, journals often feel a, a rush to publish. Um, and so they might relax their methodological standards a little bit. There's probably also a greater risk of publication bias um, because negative studies uh, are less likely to be published. We're much more interested in, in positive studies in, in a hot area. Uh, and COVID is the perfect example. Um, so let's move on to another little case vignette to, to try to illustrate the point a little bit better. Um, you're seeing a 48-year-old male patient who's generally healthy, presents with severe shortness of breath and hypoxemia with probable COVID-19 disease. 
sats on EV arrival are 64%. You get them on some high flow nasal cannula and a non rebreather and get them up to 88%. Um, he's alert, he's oriented, he's not really distressed. Um, so one of the things that we've been talking about uh, in these patients that's been talked about in both the literature and the full med world um, is awake proning for these patients. Is that something that is being actively done in London or talked about? Yep, I just uh, saw that the other day in CCTC. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm not so sure if it's being done in Emerge, but it's definitely being done in the ICU. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is one of the, the first papers to be published um, talking about uh, awake proning in COVID patients. And I'm not picking on it for any particular reason other than that it was first. Um, it was a, a case series of 50 severely hypoxemic patients. Uh, again, it wasn't controlled. Um, but what they observed uh, in these severely hypoxemic patients who were alert and able to, to roll over and get themselves in a, in a, in a prone position was that they found a, a, they saw a, a substantial improvement in oxygen saturation with five, within five minutes of, of position change. Um, and I thought their, their conclusions were actually pretty judicious. They said further studies are needed to support causality and to determine the effect of proning on disease severity and mortality. Uh, but in spite of that really cautious conclusion, um, this is something that's really gotten seized upon through FOMED and social media, um, and it's, it's generated quite a, quite a bit of buzz and practice change, uh, especially in the United States where they're seeing a large volume of, of uh, uh, patients who are profoundly hypoxemic and they're, they're trying to avoid intubation. Um, so, some of my uh, respirology and critical care colleagues in Calgary published uh, this review of literature for awake proning in COVID-19. Uh, was published just at the end of August, included 35 studies, which is a whole lot of studies in a really short period of time, uh, with 414 patients. And they again saw a pretty consistent improvement in short-term oxygenation. Um, but very limited data on adverse events. So do we know if anything bad has happened to these patients when they, when they self-prone, like are they at higher risk of aspiration? Um, and is there any difference in terms of longer term outcomes? And what they defined as long term outcomes was greater than one hour. Um, and certainly no difference on of the effects on mortality. The, the commentary um, from one of the, the authors who's a, a critical care doc and, and some of the folks, if there's any of you who are doing critical care fellowships or spending a lot of time uh, on the unit, uh, feel free to pipe in. Um, but there is a clear mortality benefit to prone positioning in mechanically ventilated patients, but it may not be necessarily related to the change in oxygen saturation and may be more associated with preventing a ventilator associated lung injury. Uh, and so it's a really open question is, uh, awake proning patients or proning patients who aren't mechanically ventilated, is that going to translate into any kind of substantial mortality benefit? So this is, this is the exact kind of case um, where high quality controlled observational studies or RCTs uh, are still needed for us to be able to, to try to say for sure whether, whether awake proning of COVID patients uh, is going to make any kind of substantial difference in patient outcomes. So COVID-19 is the paradigm example. Um, evidentiary standards shouldn't change just because a topic is emerging or hot or important uh, to all of us. Um, and be aware that in situations like this, uh, interventions are less likely to be successful than you might think they are going to be. And so uh, I'm not saying that, that uh, awake proning is is bad i'm just saying that we need to be extra critical of new of new evidence and and i think the we don't have definitive evidence yet um that awake proning is going to change outcomes for these people people these uh you know this uh the studies are still ongoing um some other tips that i want to talk about in in reviewing um uh studies especially in a uh in emerging or or hot area um, is to consider the prior probability that a new treatment is going to be effective uh, and then don't necessarily get hung up on p-values. Um, this is a slide that um, Justin Morgenstern used in his first 10 EM uh, um, uh, in his first 
uh, first ten EM blog post. Uh, it's from a, an article published in Nature. Um, basically, it's it's kind of applying Bayes' theorem to uh, to interpreting clinical trial results, and basically saying that if it's unlikely at the start of a study that a treatment is going to be effective then it takes a whole lot of convincing evidence to move the needle to the posterior probability that, that a treatment is, is gonna be effective. Uh, and some great examples of this are vitamin C and sepsis, or pretty much any uh, drug, hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, Tamiflu, uh, or whatever for COVID. So um, just looking at the, kind of at the, at the graph, if it's unlikely that a treatment's gonna be effective from the starting, from the get-go, so if it has a 5% chance of real effect, even if you see a p-value of 0.05, there's still only an 11% chance that, that that treatment is effective in real life. Um, and it's not until you get into kind of the nine to one odds in favor that uh, a single trial really point moves the needle toward being absolutely certain that, that a treatment is is going to be effective. So it's important to consider when you're looking at a study, well, what's the actual probability that this treatment was going to be effective in the first place? Um, and if it seems like a long shot, um, then we probably uh, need to be a little bit extra skeptical. Uh, Shelly McLeod, who used to be in London and is, is now in Toronto, does a, a great talk called Why P-Values Are Dead to Me. Um, and I'm not going to try to summarize her whole talk here, um, but I'm just going to try to try to say like, it's important not necessarily to get hung up on particular P-Values. So um, here's the, the definition that we, that we often see of a p-value. It's the probability of obtaining results at least as extreme as the observed results, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. And there's something that often gets left out in that definition. And really, we should think of a p-value as the probability of obtaining results at least extreme as extreme as the observed result, assuming the null hypothesis is true, and there's no bias in the findings. And it's important to remember that p-values are influenced by both effect size, so the, the observed effect of the treatment, and also by sample size. And so, especially for, for small studies with large, potentially clin clinical, clinically significant effects, you still may not see uh, 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 an impressive p-value. So it's important not to, not to get hung up on them. And, uh, so we'll use this next vignette as an example of that. Um, so you're seeing a 72-year-old patient with a known history of COPD, but is otherwise pretty healthy. They come in with increased cough, increased sputum. Um, SATs are not terrible. They're a little bit tachypneic. They're speaking in full sentences, no obvious distress. And then it's not likely that there's any other cause besides their COPD. I don't think there's anybody on this call who wouldn't give this patient prednisone. Um, but let's take a look at the initial landmark study showing that prednisone improves outcome in uh, patients with COPD. Um, it's a Canadian study published in the New England Journal in 2003 of emergency department patients with acute COPD exacerbations randomized to get prednisone or placebo. And what they found is that the 30-day re relapse rate with prednisone is 27% compared to 43%. So a really substantial improvement in the relapse rate. And rehospitalization rate within 30 days was 11% with, uh, with, with prednisone and 21% plac with placebo. And so the risk of rehospitalization was literally cut in half um, with, uh, with the addition of prednisone. But it wasn't a huge study. So the p-values were really not that impressive. So imagine what might have happened if at the time this study came out, if we said, well, the p-values aren't significant, so let's just not give prednisone to patients and let's just not pursue this further. Um, because the reality is in the intervening years, there've been a number of supportive studies, uh, Cochrane meta-analyses, 
looking at uh, at um, the impact of, of prednisone in patients with COPD exacerbations, uh, and there is a pretty clear benefit for reducing the risk of, of relapse and, and hospitalization. So, get if you've gotten hung up on the p-value on the first study, um, we probably wouldn't be where we are today in terms of providing quality care to patients with COPD. Another example I wanna use about not getting hung up on uh, p-values, and this also illustrates some of the hazards of subgroup analyses. Um, so when you're, when you're doing um, you know, multiple comparisons, if you're, if you're using a p-value of 0.05, you have a one in 20 chance of incorrectly re rejecting a, a null hypothesis. Um, and so you can find statistically significant subgroup example results just by chance or because of bias. So this is the ISIS-2 trial, um, which uh, was, um, it's an old trial, but it's, it's, it's an important one. It's one of the, one of the landmark trials that, that first showed a substantial mortality benefit for administering aspirin in patients with acute MI. And the authors of this study did a really cheeky and clever thing just to illustrate this particular point. Um, that you should be wary of subgroup analyses and not necessarily hang your hat on p-values. They did a subgroup analysis stratifying patients by the sign of the zodiac. Um, and so what they found was that ASA was effective in all patients unless you're a Libra or a Gemini. And so you know, they, I think you know, it's, it's a really cheeky and, and clever way of saying, look, just be really, really careful in interpreting um, subgroup analysis results and be really careful in hanging your hats on, on p-values and, and really consider up front what's the probability that this treatment makes a difference or does it, you know, is it really likely that zodiac sign makes a real difference in terms of your response to aspirin in the setting of an acute MI? Uh, I think it, you know, it's a really nice illustration of, of a lot of the, the points that we've, we've talked about today. Um, so I'm just gonna to sum up and, and open things up to, to questions and, and commentary uh, in a little bit. Um, so I'm just gonna close by, by reminding us ourselves that rather than, than making blanket changes in practice um, based on, on single studies, um, or emerging evidence, uh, it's important to be conscientious, explicit, and judicious about our use of current best evidence and applying that to the care of individual patients. And so take home points, always try to use the best available evidence possible, be aware of some of the limitations and the red flags of the, of the evidence that we, that we review. Uh, it's important to consider the prior probability that a treatment will be effective and consider how a piece of evidence will apply to the single patient in front of you. And so I encourage you all to be, uh, Ken Milne says, be skeptical. I say be conscientious, explicit, and judicious in the way that, uh, that we use emerging evidence. And again, thanks for the, the really, the, the kind invitation to be with you all today. Um, and then I'll, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and open things up to, to questions and commentary. So feel free to post questions in the chat. Um, or if you'd like, just uh, unmute yourself, chime in. Um, 
you want, we can just, uh, how are you guys, how's your, your caseload in, uh, with COVID in London and how are, uh, you know, how are you guys uh, trying to cope with things in the emergency department, doing things, doing things differently in terms of operations? Things going okay or are you having a rough time, rough go of things? All right, well, hey, Andrew. Uh, so I decided to walk and talk with the dog. Um, I really enjoyed kind of hearing about your thoughts on the 2018 AFib guidelines because that's actually something that as a group we started discussing quite recently over our, uh, we have a WhatsApp chat group. Um, and, and again, mixed opinions on whether or not to implement them, but it's nice to hear your thoughts on just, you know, right person, um, who, to, who to implement the guidelines with because I was feeling really guilty about not giving a DOAC to an otherwise healthy 20 year old that I cardioverted after you know, about 12 to 14 hours of AFib. Um, so I don't know if uh, we can get some of the residents to chime in with their thoughts on things. Yeah, I mean those cases are tough, especially when when the guidelines give a, you know, they say, look, this is this is a weak recommendation based on on low quality evidence, and it may be possible to to parse the risk out based on patient characteristics and and Chad score and and timing, but we chose not to do that. Um, and and even weak recommendations do tend to have a, a lot of carry a lot of force and and carry a lot of weight and. You know, we can we can probably you know we might all picture ourselves in a courtroom at some point and say you know well well Dr. McRae or Dr. Richardson are are you not aware of what the the CCS guidelines say um, and it's it, you know it, it's it can be hard to make that that compelling patient specific uh, evidence based argument um, that well what the guidelines say don't a, doesn't actually apply to to my patient um, so. Um, so I mean, I worry that 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 the way that these guidelines have been have been uh, have been written um, creates a lot of anxiety for for providers and maybe poses a bit of unnecessary risk um, with DOAC prescriptions to patients who ultimately aren't going to benefit. Yeah, and and particularly with with DOACs, I mean, they are medications not without a fairly significant risk. Um, you know, if it's spontaneous bleed or trauma and bleed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think know, I agree. We have to be very judicious in our in our use. Yeah, I mean, it's you know the young young healthy people in general probably have a lower risk of bleeding on DOAX than than yeah. old who are likely to fall. Um, but the risk is still is zero, and, and younger people are also still more likely to be doing things like like you know, biking skiing and, and uh, getting car crashes. Um, so. So you know, I, I think it's it's we really need to, to have some some nuanced uh, some nuanced thought about whether this is whether that's the whether the risks are, are worth it and and you know the the cardiologists come from it at it from a lens at of uh, you know there is a non-zero risk of stroke after unscheduled cardioversion um, and DOAX appear to mitigate that risk. Um, and we kind of had to draw a line in the sand somewhere, and it made sense for simplicity's sake to, to make a recommendation for everybody. Um, but it makes it hard for us to make individualized patient specific treatment recommendations. Sorry if I missed this, Andrew. Um, but for the DOACs, what is, what is your practice? Do you practice the CAPE best practice guidelines, the checklist, or what do you do? Yeah, for the most part, you know, if, there, if there's mitigating cases, like, you know, if they've been in the AFib for longer than 12 hours, um, or if they other, have other, separate, other cardiovascular factors, um, I might talk to them about, about um, being on a short course of DOAX um, if they're at low risk of bleeding. Um, but for the most part, I don't prescribe DOAX unless they have a CHADS 55 score one or higher, then they should be on a, on a DOAX for life anyway. And do you find that uh, the uptake in Calgary with the 2016 guidelines when Chad 65 first came out, 
that most of your colleagues are comfortable prescribing if they meet the CHAT 65 criteria? Or do you find that um, people are reluctant to have that conversation emerge? Uh, it's variable. Um, the, the, we did do kind of a QI exercise by putting a, um, a, our, our ECGs, whenever the, the computer detects it, you know, they get a little flag on them now. Consider prescribing anticoagulant, uh, and that's probably increased our, uh, our prescription rates uh, a little bit. Um, but um, I'd still say it's, it's pretty practically dependent. Yeah, we did the same. Well, one of the residents here did, uh, Irfan did a project here, and the prescription rate from Emerge was like 20% or something for all new onset AFib. Um, obviously, not, not everybody. And uh, the follow up in what we have in Arrhythmia Clinic is supposed to be up to a week, but it was, I believe, uh, I don't know if Irfan's on the call, but somewhere well over a week, like 14 days over maybe. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of one of the things that most staff were comfortable not prescribing their own DOAX because they were going to get follow-up within a week, but we found that's not actually the case for the majority of these patients who yeah. do meet CHAT 65 criteria. Yeah, reality is often, often harder than, uh, um, than, than we like. Um, so great question from, from Kelly. Find it hard with spontaneous cardioversion. Anything for you in terms of starting with high chance? Um, so if they cardioverted spontaneously, they, they still have a risk of, of, of short-term stroke. It's, it's lower than with electrical card, chemical cardioversion, um, but it's still not zero. Um, and so I, I personally treat any new episode of uh, AFib, especially in a, in a patient with a, a CHAD 65 score of one or higher, um, as an indication for starting somebody on the DOAC. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's paroxysmal AFib. Uh, until proven otherwise. Um, and you know, there may be some other idiosyncratic features that may be immediately post-surgery, for example. Um, but for the most part, if someone is coming in with a spontaneous episode of AFib uh, that converts spontaneously uh, and they're over, they're over 65, I'm recommending at least that, that uh, the patient uh, get started on a DOAC. And the other um, topic that you brought up near to the beginning of the talk was uh, regarding use of septra uh, for our abscesses with some cellulitis around them. And, yep. you know, I think, again, I think a lot of people have been adopting septra as their first line treatment for all cellulitis and not necessarily for populations at risk for uh, MRSA. So again, it's nice to, to just have that discussion around it a little bit. A little bit of a way that uh, looks at our own local rates of MRSA and uh, and again choosing the right choosing the right patient you know for uh, patients with no fixed address who may or may not have a history of IV drug use then septra is a great choice but otherwise you know it's not unreasonable to still use Keflex when appropriate or again no antibiotics at all. I mean, if it's an uncomplicated ab abscess with no cellulitis. There's a 75% chance that that patient's going to do absolutely fine with antibiotics, um, and I think if there is a an accompanying cellulitis that you're treating, I think that's a great point. Is that you kind of have to you kind of have to follow your own local antibiogram um, to say what's the what's the local uh, not only what's the local MRSA rate, but what's the local resistance pattern. So is the resistance to septra different than the, the different than the resistance to clinda in the community versus as to, to quinolones and so it's going to be a bit of a local thing. Yeah and sadly we are actually seeing some more resistance to resistance to septra um, in our in our patient population. Yeah yeah which is which is too bad because I think septra in general has fewer adverse effects than than clinda or some of the other some of the other options and so um, it's it's a it's um, it's not a great thing when we start to see septra resistance in, in MRSA populations. So the COPD example is is uh, was a, a, a no brainer. But are, have there been any anything else that that you you guys have discussed, say at recent journal clubs, in terms of newer emerging evidence and, and controversies around whether to 
whether to apply uh, a new piece of evidence in practice or challenges in, in applying it to, to individual patients. I don't know if the journal club has started yet, residents. If you guys have had any discussions. Take that as a no. <laughs> the residents are a quiet group today. Yeah, we'll uh, you give them a give them a, give them a chance to get a, a third or fourth cup of coffee and maybe, but uh, um, yeah, um, and then so yeah, so that was interesting to hear that um, that there is some um, awake proning of, of COVID patients going on in in CCTC. Is that part of a formal trial, or is is that being formally studied, or is that kind of idiosyncratic practice that uh, that you're seeing? Um, I think it's just more part of the practice here. Um, so this particular patient, he. Um, was originally admitted to medicine and came down um, about a week ago because there was concern that we'd have to intubate him because he wasn't doing well on the floor. Um, when we brought him down, we just started proning him for 16 hours a day um, and his gas has significantly improved when he was prone versus when he was supine um, and he still actually avoided intubation to date. Yeah. Um, I know there is an ongoing trial here with infectious disease, um, with remdesivir, um, but yeah. they don't work on weekends, so they wouldn't come see him. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's, yeah, so that's, I mean, it's good to hear that that particular patient's, uh, doing, doing well, um, and we could be great to, to have, um, systematic data collection just to see if not you know not just does it make a difference in their gases and their oxygen saturation but you know it, systematically in, in large groups of patients is this a is this a uh, uh, a life-saving or intubation preventing um, intervention I think it would be really great to have more robust evidence um, to, to suggest whether or not we should be doing this in in more people I've seen a couple of patients, and I think one of the issues is like patient compliance and ability to tolerate proning, because I think I've seen two now, and I think they've been encouraging proning, but a lot of it is uh, the amount of time that they can do has a lot to do with um, not just the, their, their gases and all of that, but the patient's kind of psychological aspect and ability to prone for that length of time, especially being in these like COVID precaution rooms. So I think that's been a big limiting factor for these patients. Yeah, it doesn't sound like, yeah, it's, it sounds like a, uh, um, sounds like a, you know, 16 hours a day of, of, of proning as Lana said, like, man, that'd be, that'd be tough. <laughs> Yeah, I won't lie. It was a struggle to keep him prone for that long um, last weekend when I was on call, but um, with enough coaxing and encouragement from us and the nursing staff. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, like when we talk about it, it sounds simple, like just tell the patient, roll over, lay on your stomach, look at an iPad for a while, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, the, the reality is, is, uh, is different than, than, uh, um, you know, the, the reality is, is a whole lot more challenging. Yeah. Uh, I'm just being cognizant of our time. We've got a few minutes left. Um, any other questions about either this stuff or the cardiology stuff we talked about earlier this morning. I'm happy to continue that conversation. Looks like everybody is super comfortable with applying all the evidence appropriately. <laughs> to the people in front of you. That was great. Thank you so much. That was an excellent talk. I wish we could have had it in person. But here we are. <laughs> but yeah, that was very, very timely, very appropriate, and uh, very high yield. So thank you. Thanks. Stay healthy. Stay, stay safe, everybody. <laughs>
You as well. Great. Thanks. You too. Bye, guys. Take care, Andrew. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.